Well, hello everyone, and welcome back to Adria's Digital Basement. On today's video, we're going to be revisiting the Macintosh Color Classic. If you haven't yet seen part one on this machine, I recommend you go do that now because this is sort of a continuation from there. But just to recap on the last video, the motherboard got damaged from a leaky battery, and I struggled to find out if this thing even worked or not, but I've realized eventually that without a working motherboard, you can't really test the rest of the machine. So that's where we pick up in this video. I had some viewers who were wonderful who sent in some parts to try to get this machine working. So without further ado, let's get right to it. Even though I've been making videos for Adrian's Digital Basement now for a few years, it just, it completely blows my mind how incredible my viewers are. That it wasn't just last week I put this machine on my channel, talked about it, showed it, and right away I had emails from people offering me replacement parts for it. What two different viewers have done is sent me in replacement motherboards for this machine. Um, in this one box here is actually uh, right off the bat <laughs> some Happy Cola Harry Bows. That is most excellent packing material. Boy, at this rate, I'm never gonna need to buy any more candy again for the rest of my life. My viewers are incredible. Now, I've mentioned this on the channel before, and I am a type one diabetic. Here's my insulin pump. And the thing is, when you're a type one diabetic, there are times when you do actually need to eat some sugar. So people would think normally, you not shouldn't be eating candy ever, right? Well, that's generally the case, but if I give myself too much insulin after eating a meal, then my blood sugar goes low and I have to eat something with sugar in it. So whether it be juice or candy like this or something like that. So I usually use candy for a little bit of a sugar boost. So I don't eat it in large quantities, I eat it in small quantities, but it means I get to enjoy a little bit of the sweet things that I wouldn't otherwise normally get to eat. So anyway, in this box, I think what we have is the motherboard for the Mac Color Classic. Oh, and it's really well packed. I am just uh, making sure I don't leave anything in here that's not packing material. So there's a motherboard and something small, and we have a note here. So what this is, as I keep trying to say, is I think this one is the replacement motherboard, the stock motherboard for this machine. And I had generous offers from several people to send me one of these, but I took Kale up on his offer to send this out to me. He had an extra one, and he said he would send it out, so he did. And then there is this box. Shortly after Kale had sent me out this motherboard, it dropped off in the mail. I got an email from another viewer, Tekokami. I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your, your screen name there. And he had the upgraded LC575 motherboard for this machine. That's the one that uh, brings this thing up to, I think, a 68040. So it's a way faster motherboard. This came out of a different Mac, and I am pretty sure that this is what Tekokami has generously donated to me. So let's open this up and we'll take a look at both of these together. And I have a note here and in here is the motherboard. And i um, not sure what this is. It's just a bag that says double take on it. <laughs> All right, let's unwrap these. First, I'll set this one aside. We'll look at the one from Kale. Let me just quickly look at his note. He writes, hey Adrian, your channel is one of my favorites. I honestly cannot remember how I stumbled on it a year or more ago, but I look forward to seeing your stuff. Your genuine pleasure and interest in learning and maintaining retro tech is infectious. Quite often your memories of using old computer back in the day will send me down my own memory lane. He goes on to say, I was disappointed when I learned that your color classic board was not repairable, but I was happy to hear you could put the one I had lying around to good use. In that spirit, I hope your O30 motherboard arrives whole and undamaged. Yeah, it definitely did. Lastly, knowing your love of Haribo, I threw in a couple bags of Happy Cola gummies. Oops, one just fell on the floor. I honestly cannot remember if you have mentioned liking them or not, but I took a shot by throwing them in. Well, honestly, all Haribos are good, and I totally, totally love these things. I've been eating these probably off and on for 20 years. I, I totally dig these. Keep doing these great videos and being part of a cool community. Honestly, your channel and a couple arts have kept me sane during the 2020 with COVID, politics, the economy, home lockdowns, and all that mess. Sincerely yours, Kale. That was a wonderful letter. Thank you very much, Kale. All right, so check out the motherboard. Now he mentioned that the battery had not leaked on this, 
which of course was the biggest thing. But most likely this thing will need a recap, which is expected. Oh yeah, look at that, perfect condition. This is absolutely perfect packaging. Okay, there's one RAM stick and another one. And then that, which I think is the video RAM because uh, ROM chips are over here. And if there were a ROM sim, it would be up there. Let's pull this out. Oh, that motherboard looks perfect. It's just in great shape. T taking a close look at this motherboard, the caps look in really good shape actually, but it looks like there's actually been some corrosion at some point on this board. You see there's some crust right there. But I'm going to say that this board is pretty much in good enough condition as it is now to work in this machine. Oops, I should have put this other memory module in first. And then just to remind people, this was the board that was in this machine and quite a difference in the corrosion department there. <laughs> Look at that. Look at that difference, yeah. So uh, <laughs> there's a much better chance that um, this board is gonna work than this original board. Incidentally, because I knew these boards were coming, I went ahead and put an order in for new capacitors from DigiKey. So I am no longer out of stock like I was when I recapped that Mac 2 SI. <laughs> All right, so let's check out this other one here. See the notes? All right, Tekokami's letter. It's written on Doctors Without Border letterhead. That's pretty sweet. Uh, he sent a couple stickers here, which we'll look at in just a moment. He goes on to say, hello, Adrian, and closes the Mac LC575 motherboard. This came from Computer Reset. That's an amazing place in Dallas, Texas. If anyone hasn't heard about it, there's been plenty of videos from like LGR and 8 Guy on it. Um, this came from Computer Reset when my friend Tekav, Tekov, I think I'm saying his name right. He lives in the area, went in there to buy parts and items for Retro Computing Group I helped run. I was looking for 68,000 related Mac stuff and this was one of the items he found for me. Now, why would I send this to you, he says? Because back in part one of your Color Classic Restoration series, the motherboard was nuked by an exploding lithium battery, leaving you with a broken Mac. This motherboard can be used in it, doing what is known as the Mystique Upgrade. But enough talk, it is time to start part two of the Color Classic Restoration series. Let's go. Yep, that's right. Let's get right to it. Sincerely, Tekokami, PS, free stickers enclosed. A virgin brand new designed for Windows NT and Windows 95 sticker. How would that look on this Mac right here, like in the corner? <laughs> and the other sticker, I am trying to get it. It's very glossy, so it's hard to show up in the camera. Uh, I'm not quite sure what this is. It's like a bird or something. Anyone knows what this is? Please comment in the comment section below. Okay, let's take a look at this motherboard. So I never would have thought in a million years that I would have gotten one of these motherboards for this machine. So um, when Tekokami reached out to me and said that he was gonna send one, I started doing research on this and what it means to have a Mac Classic, Color Classic with one of these in it. There are mods that are necessary to be done, including some 3D printing, which I'll get to in a little bit, but the motherboard is a big upgrade over the stock one from a speed perspective. And let's just pull this out of the bag here. Take a look at that. Compared to, well, this is the bad motherboard, but compared to this one, you'll notice a big difference is right here. That is a Motorola 68040. Even at the same clock speed, the 68040 is a big speed increase over this. I think it's got some cache in there that really speeds things up. It's just, overall, it's great. And then the other thing that's different is the RAM slots. Notice there, if we look at the original motherboard, these are 30 pin memory slots. Yeah, this slot right here, this is the 72 pin memory slot. This can accommodate 32 bit memory, which of course is what 72 pin memory is. That's in comparison to these, which are eight bit each. And these memory slots, there's only two of them you notice. That means that it's a 16 bit data bus to a 32 bit processor. So you actually have a bottleneck going on there. While I think this one has a 32 bit data bus. And then we can put in a larger capacity memory module here. I am gonna say that this board definitely is sporting its original capacitor. So yeah, it's gonna need a recap, but that was completely expected. There's all of this white stuff on here. I think that wipes off, it's like dust. Although I see some crust around the processor here, so that's not great. There are a lot of tantalums on here. All these yellow ones here are tantalums. So that's good, those don't leak. But of course we still have some electrolytics here and here and there. Actually, it's quite a lot of electrolytics. And yeah, those leak. Uh, did these leak? Yeah, they did a little bit but not terribly, not terribly at all. All right, so two motherboards. I'm gonna start with the original classic one from Kale, and we're gonna see how this thing is working with this motherboard, recap it, get this thing all up and running nicely, and then focus on this mystic upgrade here. 
So while the Matte Color Classic looks like it's mostly assembled, there's actually quite a few parts I didn't put back inside of it. This here in the blue bag is the original floppy drive with the speaker as well. So that's two separate modules. Of course, this is the back plate here, which goes with the original motherboard. And what is this? This looks like the fan module. So this is what goes back here. So I think I'm just gonna go right for it. And I'm gonna install this motherboard in this computer right now. We're gonna get a keyboard and mouse and turn this thing on. And we'll slide this motherboard in. There we go, plug that in. As many people had pointed out, you do need a keyboard and a mouse to get this thing to turn on because just turning on the power switch there, that does not do it. You absolutely need to push the power button, which is this one right here on the keyboard. So now that we have functional ADB ports, can plug that in right there, plug in a power cord, turn this around so everyone can see it. I'm gonna turn the power switch on the back here. Interesting, it degaussed the CRT, but of course nothing else happened because um, without pushing the power button, nothing would turn on, right? And here we go, let's try turning this on. All right, well, there's no fan, there's no speaker, so we're not hearing that, there's no hard drive. So we're not hearing the normal spin-up sounds. We're also not getting any activity. Now, that doesn't mean that things are completely bad though, because I had an email from someone who repairs a lot of Macs, and I think some people commented about this as well. He told me, I'm turning the power off by the way, he told me that this particular motherboard, it will not turn on unless you have a battery installed. You actually have to have a functional CMOS battery or you get what seems like a dead computer. Let me slide this motherboard out. Now what's interesting is I've repaired quite a few Macintoshes on the channel and, and otherwise, and I have never personally run up on against a computer that needed to have a battery installed for it to work. But I've actually run into other PC type computers, PCs like um, some Intel motherboards, they need to have a working CMOS battery. So it's quite possible that Apple did this. And that was this one gentleman's experience who sent me an email. He said he had a computer that appeared dead when he put a battery in there, or changed the battery. I think it had an old one. He swapped it with a new one. The computer came to life and worked. So let's do that. I do not have any of these batteries that go in there, but that is just a normal three volt lithium. So I'm gonna be using a CR2032 in a holder here. So I have two clip leads connected and I'm just gonna clip on to here. Let's try to do this in a way that's low profile <laughs> so I can slide the motherboard in still. Let's try this again. Yeah, I'm just taking a look and they are still connected. So that's a good sign. Okay, try number two. Turn this on. Here we go. Certainly not getting anything interesting. It definitely seems to not be doing anything. I'm just gonna try the other ADB port here. Power is on, it is plugged into the power mains. I heard the monitor kind of do something when I first plugged it in, but no click, no nothing. All right, time to take this thing apart, try to plug in some other accessories. At least if there's a fan and a hard drive, we'll know that there's power running or not because right now we just can't tell, but certainly doesn't seem to be doing anything. All right, here's the precarious setup. I have the fan connected, here it is. Um, it normally is on the back of the case and it makes contact right here when you put the case on, but I've used clip leads. I hooked up the speaker. Here's the speaker wire. It's just sort of sitting in here. It normally does sit in that cavity. M keyboard is connected, ADB keyboard, and the uh, battery is still connected. I did test with my multimeter to make sure three volts, it's 3.2, is getting through to the motherboard, and it is, absolutely. And we'll turn this on. Okay, I heard the power supply kind of come on, and let's press this button. Nothing. Now, I'm pretty sure this power button works, but just in case, here's another keyboard. It's one for my Apple II GS. Nothing. Oh, man. So I really need to know, is this chassis, is this power supply working? I mean, it's weird how it powers up fine um, without the motherboard in there. You know, all the power rails are generated, and yet it won't power up with the motherboard in there. So I'm, I, I got to wonder, um, maybe the Mystic motherboard. I just need to put the Mystic motherboard in here. We'll test that. I know it won't work because you do need to mod this uh, monitor to support 640 by 480 with that Mystic motherboard. It doesn't drop down to the low enough resolution that this motherboard does. But it should at least turn on this thing. We just won't get a proper picture on there. So I'm just going to test that out. Okay, Mystic motherboard. Slide this in. 
Is it Mystique or Mystic? Am I saying it wrong? Apologies if I am. Whoops. Uh, it only has one ADB port on the back as opposed to two. We'll use the Apple II GS keyboard just for fun. Look at that, it worked. It turned on. Oh, wow, so that means the other motherboard is bad. Let's just try that one more time. So power this on, nothing's happening. I push the power button here. There it is, turns on. Look at that. The motherboard is definitely trying to run though and it's probably bad capacitors that's resulting in no sound. That's a very common problem with these, with these computers. So that tells us that this motherboard turned this on, that this is at least sort of working and it should turn the other one on and it's not. I'm just gonna slide this back in and try it one more time, just for fun here. I mean, I'm holding the power button down and nothing is happening. All right, well, I think the only thing there is left to do now is to take this board out, inspect it very carefully and recap it and hope that that fixes this power on circuit problem. I'm starting to end up with a little collection of capacitors. So I keep them in this box. And it's all a matter of finding the right ones. I used my needle nose as usual to do the twist method to get these caps off, which I know really grinds some people's gears, but sorry, that's just the way I do it. Next up, tweezers to bend the little legs on what's left on the board and pull them off. You kind of bend them back and forth enough times that they snap off and you lift off any other loose components that are left behind from removing the caps. I didn't get any video of the board after I removed the capacitors, but I did take some photos. So take a look, even though the board looked really clean before I took the capacitors off, underneath was hiding some surprises. And you can see the corrosion and whatnot that was under those caps. Some of them were leaking so much that it was actually wet under the board. And that was just from the capacitor leaking. I'm using my flux pen to apply some flux right where the leftover bits of the capacitor are because I need to remove those with my soldering iron. Removing the capacitors with the twist method results in little bits of the capacitors being left behind on the pad. So you do have to remove those. And that's what I'm doing here with a soldering iron. You just heat it up and then you can just sort of lightly brush away the parts. And I'm sticking it in a little bit of the wire mesh there to clean the tip of the solder iron because usually the little residual part of the cap, it's a little leg, stays behind on the tip. So you just gotta get that off. And the final step is getting rid of any trace of the solder that's left on the pads because usually it's been corroded by the capacitor leakage and you really do need to clean that all off. So solder braid and the solder iron will clean those pads up really nicely. After cleaning up the pads with the solder braid, I took the board over to the sink and I gave it a good washing with soap and water, as I always do. And this is how it looked after that process. The pads look really, really good. So even though it was a little crusty under the caps, very little corrosion actually took place, at least visibly. What I'm doing here is I am installing a CR2032 battery holder on the motherboard. I removed the original one and I like to put the 2032s on just because of not having to buy those proprietary batteries. I mean, CR 2032s are easy to get and they're very, very unlikely to leak. Okay, recapping is complete. I did also replace the, the old battery holder with a CR 2032. And unlike on the Mac 2 Si, <laughs> there are no vias or anything running underneath this. In fact, um, you see the pin that's going off here. That's just the negative that goes to the ground plane and that's everything under the battery. So <laughs> no shorting out this time. You have to be careful for that. The recapping went as, as expected. Everything cleaned up really nicely and it was easy to get the caps back on. This board had minimal damage from that, except there's one chip, this one right here, that does have a couple pins that aren't looking so great. Now I don't have any idea how good the zoom is on here, but one of the pins, the plating has come off because it had blue crustiness, which I scraped off. And on the other side, same thing. And this chip, unfortunately, um, the battery here goes right into this chip. So this is probably responsible also for the power on of this machine. So if this chip is damaged because the blue crusties that are on there, then unfortunately this board isn't gonna work. Now what's worrisome about the blue crusties being on these legs is sometimes they can make their way inside the package and destroy it. And um, the copper that's exposed, the plating that's on this one leg, it is right at the package. And there was a lot of blue crusty, I scraped it all off, but um, yeah, I'm, I'm a bit worried, unfortunately. So let me repopulate this RAM back onto here and uh, we'll hope for the best, right? All right, 
into this case. It goes, power this on, fan, watch the fan. Yeah, darn, we got nothing. That is so very disappointing, wow. All that work and it's still not working. As I mentioned earlier in the video, I was told that this battery is required for the board to even turn on. So with the battery on there, I did also uh, trace out the, the battery voltage going into this chip and I actually found the full three volts. It's 3.2 off the battery. Then there's a diode, a shock key diode probably. And then it's uh, three volts going into this chip. And I also saw a little bit of other activity on it. And that's why this thing is out of the computer. I assume it's running the real time clock. One of the problems here is I don't know if the Matt Color Classic chassis is even working. I don't even know if it's good. It might be bad, but I did turn on with the Mystic board in there. I know this is really a long shot. I'm gonna take this RAM off of here. Next, I wanna check these voltage connectors here, see if we have any shorts to ground. All right, from ground to, I don't know, these two rails here, we're getting 461 ohms. These are probably the ground connectors. There's two of those in the middle. And that one, we're not getting anything from ground. Yeah, we're getting about 450 ohms from five volts to ground, which, you know, it's not terrible. I, I don't know, you know, who knows what this thing does when it's off, but uh, it's definitely not a dead short. So that's a good sign. After finding there were no shorts on the board, I decided to start looking around the chip with the corrosion on it. And with the little magnifying glass I had, I noticed that the trace that leads to this pin right here looked broken. I scraped away the solder mask from the top of the copper trace, and sure enough, I was not getting continuity from that copper trace to the pin itself. There was actually a little break right there at the base of the pin. I didn't really get a good photograph of it, so I can't show you, but I could see the break with my little magnifying glass. So I just took a little thin piece of wire, and I know it looks huge in this picture, but it's a really small component, and I soldered that piece of wire on top of the scraped off trace to the pin, and I now had continuity. Unfortunately, this didn't fix the problem. The motherboard still wouldn't turn on when I stuck it in the case and tried. Okay, it's the next day and I decided to sleep on the problems I was having with the classic color classic motherboard. And when I woke up, I thought, you know, maybe there are schematics for this board. I know Apple hasn't released them. Perhaps there are third party ones. And sure enough, there are third party ones. I've used these schematics before in fixing Mac classic, I think as well and they have the Color Classic uh, schematics. So I'll put a link in the description to this, but I think with this, we should hopefully get this board working today. So what we're looking at right here is page six from the schematics, and this is the circuit that matters for turning on the computer. And the reason why we can tell is over here on the right, this is the ADB connector, and I've highlighted the power on pin right there. That's the power switch pin. That is this pin right here. So it comes in, it goes through, uh, I don't know, this is like a ferrite bead or something like that, kind of an inductor type thing. And it goes into this MCU chip. This is the chip right here. This is the chip that handles the real-time clock and also the turn-on circuitry for this particular Mac. Now, I've already fixed that particular broken trace that fed into this pin, but remember it had that blue crusty stuff going on it. So there may be some problems on here. All right, so back to this. So the two things that are relevant are this pin right here on the ADB, which is the ground signal that goes to it, and then the power on signal. And right here, and I've highlighted this in green, I'm sorry it's not super easy to tell, but this, the same thing here, this thing here going into this IC, and this here, which is the connector into the case, these are all the five volts always on power. So when you put the motherboard in the case, you turn the power switch on, these get energized with five volts. That powers up this circuit and allows it to work and like turn on the computer, for instance. Now the real-time clock battery, three volt, that's right here, and it feeds into this chip U8, and then U8 outputs that voltage to this green signal as well. So this plus five volts, if it's not inside the computer and it's, you just pull the motherboard out or you have the power switch turned off, then these are all at three volts, which is coming from the battery. But as soon as you plug the power into the computer and turn it on, then all of these get energized up to five volts. And I assume what this chip does is it probably switches off the battery so that the battery doesn't drain while the computer's powered up. So the battery is only working when the machine is off. So the main chip here, it gets sent that five volts power or the three volts from the battery on all of these pins right here. I've highlighted them all in green. And then two really important pins are 10 and 14. So this is going to the connector J13B. That's the big edge connector on the motherboard right here. This is the edge connector. 
And it is one of these two signals, I'm not sure which one it is, that actually turns on the power supply, which ends up turning on the entire computer. So pushing the power button does something in this, and then a signal is sent through one of these two pins to turn it on. So now I'm armed with this information. I need to just go with my multimeter and double check that all of these signals are good. Everything on here, all the way from the keyboard into these chips, all these power rail things, everything is connected through. And that way I can fix any broken traces there are and hopefully get this thing to turn on. So this is the motherboard that Kale sent and I went ahead and I labeled these connectors. So this is A, this is B, and this one is C. And the reason why that matters is because when we look down here, it says J13C. J13C is this part. This is all J13, but it's got A, B, and C. So the various pins that I need to check, like these ones that are the five volts always on, those are carried over these, this connector here. Now this connector has pins on both sides and I've figured out that the top side here are odd pin numbers and the bottom side here are even. So when I look at this here and I look at pin 25, 29, 33, and 37, for instance, those are gonna be on the top side of this connector here. So easy for me to check, but 10 and 14, for instance, are on the bottom side. So I'm gonna take my multimeter on continuity. I'm gonna take this motherboard. I'm gonna start looking for anything that's broken. And I'm back. So I actually have found a problem. And <laughs> that's a really good thing. So the ADB side here, this is all good. Everything is connected through from uh, the keyboard connector all the way into the chip and the ground is good. So that's fine. The always on power coming from the connector, this is good. And I find that signal at all of these pins here and this signal right here as well. So basically because um, when it's out of the case and I don't have that five volts, what happens is you end up finding the battery voltage at these pins because this chip here is feeding the battery voltage into this voltage rail here. Pin two, this was the broken trace, uh, the one that was going to that chip that I fixed. So I'm glad I fixed that. I don't know how necessary it is, but it might be. So that one is fixed now. So all these pins going into here are working. I'm getting that, that battery voltage everywhere. But I have found a problem right here. This is not connected. Pin 10 to pin two on this IC, it does not go through. Now I have this motherboard, which is the spare one with all this broken damage here. And on this one, pin two on this IC right here, it does go through to pin 10, which is on the backside. That is connected. But on the motherboard from Kale, it is not connected. Now, unfortunately, it's hard to figure out exactly where the brake is because the, it comes up through a V and it kind of goes over here and then up under these RAM and it goes over here somewhere. And it's basically coming up through vias somewhere under this stuff over here. And this motherboard uses mostly tented vias, means the vias are covered in the solder mask. So it's actually really hard to use my multimeter probe to probe them. This right here is the bad motherboard, but it actually this signal is connected and I can find that signal right there. So if I run something from this via on the other motherboard over to here, that should fix the fault. But yeah, the fault somewhere lies in here and I'm predicting it's up in that area specifically because um, there are these capacitors here that leaked and it must have leaked underneath the connector or somewhere and caused damage. Now, I did inspect under these capacitors when I had them off on the other board when I recapped it, and there was no damage whatsoever that I could see. But there's vias underneath here and under here or wherever it is, and I, since I can't find it, there could be damage there that I just I can't see. And this is the motherboard from Kale, so I'm on pin 10 there, and I'm going to the same via there, and I'm not getting anything at all. Now, if I go to this via here, and I go to the other side of the trace, which is this one, I am getting continuity. And I have checked if I flip this motherboard on its side and I go from the via the black probe is on here to that chip, pin two, I get continuity. So this via here has continuity of the chip, but it does not go from there over to pin 10. So I need to reconnect that with a wire. And there we have it, the ugliest bodge wire ever. It goes from there. I snaked through these SIM sockets here to this hole there. And then it comes over here and it goes all the way across and ends up on the right pin there. And now when I go from pin 10 here, I get continuity on these vias over here. So I fixed the break. Um, I tried to run this bodge wire right into one of these vias, but because they're, they're tented and they're filled with solder mask, I just, it wouldn't go in. I always find that if you try to take a bodge wire and you put it into a tented via, it, it might hold on, but it's such a tiny connection, it's so precarious, it might just come out at any time. And this is gonna be a much more solid connection, even though it's a really long and roundabout way of doing this. I'll probably heat up the 
hot glue gun and I'll put a couple dabs of hot glue to keep this wire down as well. I'm using Kapton tape or Krapton, my fake tape right now. All right, with that, we now have a working signal for pin 10 and I didn't mention, but pin 14 was already good. That means that all of these signals that I've just checked are good now. And definitely, I'm pretty sure that this pin 10 is the one responsible for turning on the machine. So this board was trying to boot up the computer and it just couldn't. So you know what this means now? Time to try this in the actual computer. Okay, here we go. Let's uh, lift this up and slide this in. And the reason why I didn't run the, v the uh, bodge wire along the left side of the sims is because I knew that um, that's not a good idea just because uh, the wire would be underneath the plastic of where the case holds the motherboard. And we'll plug the ADB keyboard in like so. Here we go. Hey! Turned on the computer. Uh, no sound though. Oh, everyone, we have a picture. We have a picture. Okay, I'm gonna turn this off now. So we can uh, turn this, so I can turn this to face the camera so everyone can see it. I'll remove the fan. Okay, here we go, try number two. Oh, it turned on. Look at that, we got the green power LED. Wonder why there's no sound. Look, look, look at that. Oh, we have a mouse pointer. It's working. <laughs> And hold on, I'm not sure I actually said it. Would you look at that? It's working, it's actually working. All right, the computer booted, but it's not quite working. I've, I've identified a couple faults right off the bat. First of all, it thinks there's a floppy disk in the drive and it can't initialize it. So it has this error message about being locked. And if I hit okay, it just keeps popping up. Well, the disk drive is not even in the computer. It's actually sitting right over here. So it could well be that just having no drive connected has it freaking out. Although I haven't seen this particular behavior on other Macintoshes. The other issue is there's no sound. Um, now, right now, because that's stuck in this loop, I can't get to the sound control panel, but it did boot up successfully once. And I was able to go to sound and the volume is turned all the way up in there. And yet there's just no sound altogether. And I double check the speaker is connected and that's gonna require some troubleshooting. But really, other than the fact that the geometry of the monitor is a little bit out, but that's adjustable, um, this thing does appear to be working. I'm running system 7.5.3. I didn't have a zip disk uh, that had that on there. I only had 7.1 and 6.0 something or other. So I had to make this off of one of my other computers that had 7.5.3. And as you see, it did boot up. Although, um, you know, I don't know what the actual minimum system version is for the Color Classic, but this one does seem to be working. I also found something interesting because there's no actual reset button on this. I thought, what if it's control open Apple reset or the power button, which is which reboots an Apple II, like an Apple II GS. This key combination does that, watch this. That actually does the reboot on the Macintosh, which is really surprising. And I think if you push the Apple, open Apple key or the, I don't know what this key is called on the Macintosh, but on the Apple, it's called open Apple. You push this and you push the, um, inter the power button, it's the equivalent of pushing the interrupt button on the side of older Macintoshes, which of course gives you an unhappy Mac, which is completely normal, but control open Apple reset and the machine reboots. <laughs> That's pretty cool. I've never seen a Mac that had that key combination. I mean, the Macintosh 2CI does not, or the 2SI or any of the older classic Macs. And this is actually the newest Macintosh with ADB that I've ever used. Okay, I'm gonna end this video here. In the next part, I'm gonna take a look at the motherboard and try to figure out why the sound's not working. Also try to figure out why it's getting that weird floppy drive error when you boot up. In addition, I'll take a look at the motherboard Tekokami sent in, the LC575 motherboard with the 6840 processor, the Mystic upgrade for this machine, and I'll try to get that board working as well. So if you enjoyed this video, I would appreciate a thumbs up, but if you didn't, you know what to do. And of course, hit that subscribe button to subscribe to my channel and the notification icon if you want to be notified when I upload new videos. Put your comments and your suggestions down in the comment section below. I always appreciate it when you do that. And that's going to be it. Stay healthy, stay safe, and I'll see you next time. Goodbye.